everyone and welcome to Seven Oaks Campaigners Online. Today we're thinking about science again and its forces. So we're thinking about some key ideas on forces. When we think of forces, a name that often springs to mind is Sir Isaac Newton because he had lots of ideas about forces and he wrote them down in 1687 though unfortunately for us he wrote them in Latin. It's probably best if we stick to English. Uh, the most important of his ideas about forces was to say what forces do and Newton's idea was this. Forces cause a change in movement. Now when I say a change in movement I mean that they make something go faster or slower or change its direction. Those three things would mean a change in movement, either speeding up or slowing down or changing direction. So you need a force to do that. Take a look at this train. It's going along at a steady speed and it's going straight. So there is no change in its movement. So we don't need any forces. Now wait a minute, you're thinking, what about the engine? Surely the engine must be doing something. Yes, you're right. So I need to say things more carefully. We usually mark forces with an arrow to show their direction. So the engine is making a forward force on the train. Here's the arrow. Friction is making a backwards force on the train. So here's the arrow for that. And those two forces are balancing each other. If the engine was to make more forward force, then the train would speed up. On the other hand, if the driver turns the engine off, the only force will be friction and the train will slow down. So, here's a better way of saying the rule. If the forces on the train are not balanced, then the movement of the train will change. Now there is a common misunderstanding here. Forces cause a change in the way something is moving. But you'll often hear people say that forces cause movement. That's not quite right. Forces cause a change in the movement. So look at this spacecraft. It's a common idea in films that if a spaceship is moving quickly, it must have its engines running. But that isn't true. If you're away from gravity, you only need the engines to get up to speed. After that, you can turn them off and you'll just keep going. Now, back in 1977, this space probe was launched. Actually, there were two of them, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 and they were sent to explore the outer planets in the solar system. Well, that was over 40 years ago. Those spacecraft are still going, and we're still in touch with them. They're going at about 40,000 miles an hour, but they don't have any engines running. It's amazing that after 40 years or so, they're still working at all. And they're so far away that the messages from them take the best part of a day to get back to us. Having said that, despite 40,000 miles an hour and over 40 years, they're still less than one thousandth of the way to the nearest star, apart from our sun. Anyway, the point is that with no significant forces on them, they would just keep going at 40,000 miles an hour in a straight line until they hit something. Where there are no forces or where all the forces balance, an object just keeps going at a steady speed in a straight line until it hits something. As it happens, that's pretty much my strategy if I go ice skating. I'm quite good at getting going, but not very good at stopping. And the thing about ice skating is that once you're going on the ice, there isn't very much friction. And so you can 
keep going for a long way without doing anything particular. So I get up to speed, and I know all the stuff about using skates to stop, but I just have trouble doing it. So I end up going at a steady speed in a straight line until I hit something and I crash into the barriers to stop. Here's another example of where the force is balanced. This is a parachutist and there are two forces on the parachutist. Gravity is pulling downwards and that's balanced by friction or perhaps we'd better say air resistance from the parachute upwards. The two forces balance so the parachutist goes at a steady speed until he hits something, the ground, and so he stops by crashing. If we go back to the spacecraft, it's worth remembering that you need fuel to speed up to get going, and then you can just keep going. But if you want to stop without crashing, you're going to need fuel again to slow down. And actually, you're going to need food, uh, fuel if you want to change direction as well. Have a look at this little animation. When the spacecraft wants to turn to change its direction, it has to fire a little sideways rocket motor. You see, you need a force to speed up or slow down, but you also need a force to change direction. That counts as a change in the movement. This means that any vehicle that's going around a corner must have an unbalanced force working on it and that force has to nudge the vehicle sideways just like the little rocket on our spacecraft. So a change in direction is a change in movement that needs a force. Now one surprising example of this is a satellite or a spaceship in orbit around the Earth. As the satellite is going around the Earth it's continually turning a corner. So to do that, there has to be a sideways force on it. What do you think that would be? If you thought it was gravity, you're quite right. When a satellite is put into orbit around the Earth, we have to set it moving at just the right speed so that gravity will keep nudging it sideways just enough to keep it going round in a circle. If the gravity pulls too hard, the satellite will fall towards the Earth and crash. If gravity doesn't pull hard enough, the satellite will fly off into space. So, there we are. Unbalanced forces cause a change in movement. Scientists call that a change in velocity. And it can be speeding up or slowing down or a change in direction. When forces on a vehicle balance, the vehicle will just keep going at a steady speed in a straight line. Isaac Newton came up with another important idea about forces when he said that forces come in opposite pairs. Every time you have a force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. He's supposed to have thought of this from seeing an apple tree in his garden. This is the very tree. Apple trees don't usually survive for 400 years, but you can still see this one at the place where Newton lived, in Warsthorpe Manor, near Grantham. In fact, the tree was actually blown down during a storm in 1820, but it rerouted itself, so it's still there. Any stories you read about an apple falling on Newton's head are just made up. But it is worth thinking about what happens when an apple is falling. So here is one. The movement of the apple is changing. It's speeding up as it falls. So there must be an unbalanced force. It's gravity again. The force of gravity pulls the apple towards the earth. There is a little bit of air resistance, but that's so small that we're going to forget about that. Now what Newton realised was that forces come in opposite pairs. So as gravity pulls the apple towards the Earth, there is 
an exactly opposite force pulling the earth towards the apple. Of course the apple is very small and the earth is huge so the force on the apple has a big effect on such a small object but the same size force pulling on the earth really doesn't do very much at all. You might have thought that idea was a little bit surprising but having said that it's still a pretty simple idea. Forces come in pairs so for every force there is always an equal and opposite force. Well it might be a simple idea but it is very easy to get it simply wrong. I'll show you what I mean. Suppose someone catches the apple and holds it still. What has happened to the forces? Well, gravity hasn't been turned off, so the earth is still pulling on the apple. But now there's a new force come into the picture. The person's hand is pushing up on the apple. We might call that a contact force. The apple is still, its movement isn't changing anymore, so the forces on it have to balance. The pull of gravity on the apple downwards is balanced by the contact force from the hand upwards. So far so good. We have two forces on the apple, gravity downwards and contact force upwards, and those two forces balance each other. But each force must have a reaction force, an equal and opposite force. So there actually has to be two pairs of forces. The reaction force for gravity pulling downwards on the apple is the apple pulling upwards on the earth. The reaction force to the upwards contact force from the hand is a downwards contact force on the hand by the apple. Let's take a different example. Let's think about an aeroplane flying at a steady speed in one direction. The engine is making a forward force and there is a backward force of air resistance. Those two forces are balancing, so the speed of the plane doesn't change. Now each of those forces will have a reaction force, but just so that we can keep the diagram from getting too complicated, we'll just think about the up and down forces, the vertical ones. The air is making a lifting force on the wings. And in reaction to that, the wings are pushing down on the air. The earth is pulling downwards on the plane, uh, that's with gravity. And the reaction to that is that the plane is pulling upwards on the earth with gravity. The plane is m moving, but its movement isn't changing. We've already said that the forward and backward forces balance, so speed isn't changing. But in fact the height isn't changing either. And so that means that the upward forces working on the plane must balance the downward ones. But what are those forces? Which forces are working upwards or downwards on the plane? If you were thinking the lifting force upwards and the gravity downwards, you were right. Those two forces work on the plane. Those two forces must balance each other. Now there are some other forces there. The wings are pushing downwards on the air. But that's not a force on the plane. That's a force on the air. So that's not what we were looking for. There is gravity pulling up on the earth. Well that's not working on the plane either, that's working on the earth. 
So we weren't looking for that force either. There is gravity pulling down on the plane. It's worth noticing that the force that balances that is not the reaction force. It's not the earth pulling up, it's not the plane pulling up on the earth. It's the air pushing up on the aeroplane that makes the balancing force, and that's what keeps the aeroplane in the air. Finally, here are a couple of force puzzles. Be prepared, most people get these wrong. In the first one, you can see a football and it's just been kicked straight upwards. So the football there has just been kicked and it's now going straight upwards. The question is, what forces are now working on the ball? And here's a clue, there are two of them. But what are they? Remember, we only want the forces working on the ball. If you had gravity as one of them, very good. Here is the force of gravity on the ball. Perhaps you were puzzled that there was only one more force. Well, there is only one more. It is air resistance on the ball. The ball is going upwards, so Air resistance is a downwards force. If you had that answer, very well done. Most people find that answer quite surprising. And they will say things like, well, I thought you said the ball was going upwards. So how come there are only two forces and they're both downwards? Well, you have to remember where we started with this video that unbalanced forces don't cause movement, they cause a change in movement. Although the ball is going upwards, it's slowing down. The change in movement is downwards. So there is gravity pulling it down, and that's what's slowing it up. And in fact, air resistance is helping the process. The only time there was an upwards force was when the ball was actually being kicked. And just for a fraction of a second there, there was a very big upward force. It was a contact force while the ball was in contact with the boot. But as soon as the ball had left the boot, gravity and air resistance took over and both of the forces on the ball were downwards. So let's change the game. It's beach volleyball. The team on the right has hit the ball. It's high in the air and it's going towards the team on the left. So if the ball is going from right to left across the picture, what forces are working on the ball? Again, we are only interested in the forces actually working on the ball. So what do you think they are? Yes, gravity is one of them, again. There is a pull of gravity downwards on the ball. So well done if you said that. Now things become a little more tricky. There is only one more force on the ball, and that is air resistance backwards on the ball. Again, there's that peculiar thing. The ball is going towards the left, but there isn't a force in that direction. Just like the football, the movement of the ball is changing. For one thing, its direction is changing. So eventually it's going to come down. And gravity does that. There is air resistance on the ball, probably not very big. And that tends to slow the ball up. The only time when there was a force to the left was when the ball was being hit. Again, just for a fraction of a second, there was a big force to the left that got the ball going. After that, gravity and air resistance took over. Perhaps you can see from these two examples that it's pretty easy to become confused when we're thinking about forces. And I'm hoping that this video has helped you 
to see your way through some of the confusion. I'm going to leave you with a third example. This is a picture of a couple of reusable rockets from SpaceX and they're in the process of landing. So they're not going up, they're going down and they're firing their engines as they are coming in to land. And so the question is, what are the three forces acting on those rockets as they come in to land? I wonder whether you know what they are. Goodbye.